With each new step and turn Egyptians take towards a new future, one group remains at the center, the Muslim Brotherhood and its political arm, the Freedom and Justice Party. The movement supporters maintain that the Muslim Brotherhood has earned and is capable of playing a dominant role in an elected government. But others are critical and even fearful of what is perceived as the movement's religious agenda. Our party is not a religious party, but it's a civil party and we want to see modern democratic country. To find out what the Muslim Brotherhood and its political arm really wants, we talked to its Secretary General, Mohammed Saad Katatni. The interview you are about to see was recorded shortly after a violent incident involving Christian cops here in Egypt. But it was before the political upheaval that's been centered on Tahrir Square behind me here. The momentous events of the past few days then are not reflected in my conversation with the Secretary General, but we believe it provided a valuable insight into the agenda of the Muslim Brotherhood and its Freedom and Justice Party. And we believe it will give a greater understanding of what direction they believe the country should go. Here now is that conversation. Mohammed Sahad al Khatatni, thank you very much for talking to us on Al Jazeera. To begin with, um, you were a member of the Guidance Committee of the Muslim Brotherhood, now Secretary General of the Freedom and Justice Party. Explain the connection between party and movement. The Muslim Brotherhood and the Freedom and Justice Party are the same when it comes to ideas and political direction. But financially and administratively, the party is an independent entity, which means the movement does not give binding orders to the party, despite the fact they have the same political direction. The party carries the political vision of the movement and turns this vision into projects to be implemented. The party's target is to join the parliament, then the government, while the movement does not have such a target. The target of the movement is advocacy, social activities, and then expressing its views regarding general political issues. The movement will never have its own members of parliament or ministers because these posts are only to be filled by members of the party, which is again an independent entity. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood is one of the oldest political movements within Egypt, one of the oldest national movements. How important is it for the Brotherhood to be perceived as a national party? The movement has a big political project. And in Egypt, there is a multi-party system. So the only way to implement the movement's project is to establish itself as a political party. This is why we now have the Freedom and Justice Party to express and demonstrate the ideas of the Muslim Brotherhood. The movement has established this party and introduced some of its active members into it so as to create this strongest party in Egypt according to the results of recent polls published by the Egyptian newspapers. Despite the fact that we are a newborn party, our party is a novelty. Now, novelty indeed, because for the first time it's fighting an election as a party, as a freedom and justice party. In the past, the Muslim Brotherhood was banned um, from the days of Nasser, banned under uh, Mubarak, and now it is able to contest the political playing field on an, an even basis. Do you see it that way? Mm -hmm. uh, the movement was really involved in elections, but you know the movement was really suffering from the practices of the deposed regime. Now, and after the revolution, the picture is different, and the party is busy getting ready for these elections. It's the Freedom and Justice Party that will handle the elections, not the movement. The Muslim Brotherhood movement 
will only help the Freedom and Justice Party during these elections because without the movement, the party will be weak. The Muslim Brotherhood movement is a social power to support the party without any involvement in its affairs. Now, critics of the Muslim Brotherhood and of the Freedom and Justice Party maintain that its primary concern is religion, that its primary concern is the Islamic faith on which it is based at the expense of nationhood, at the expense of the interests of Egypt itself. What is your response to that? If you want to know what principles guide our party, let me tell you. They are the principles of the Islamic Sharia law, and they are included in the Egyptian constitution. Our party is not a religious party, but it's a civil party, and we want to see modern democratic country. We reject a religious country to be governed by imams, who issue laws because the parliament is the only authority entitled to issue laws within the framework of the Islamic Sharia. The imams should have nothing to do with resolving differences in the interpretation of the law. That's the job of the High Constitutional Court. So, our party is a civil party that seeks a modern and democratic state, but with an Islamic reference. We see the principles of Islamic Sharia law as the framework that governs us when we enact laws. Uh, just to make clear, Article 2 of the Egyptian constitution does declare that Islam is a state of Egypt, mm -hmm. and making very clear that laws must be made with reference to Sharia law. That being said, though, you said very clearly there that you still see the ultimate authority as the superior court, as the Supreme Court, as the ultimate legal authority within Egypt. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, the fear, for example, too, from your critics that women, for example, will not be allowed to play a major role in the party, um, that you oppose and the party oppose the idea of either a woman or a Christian becoming prime minister or president, for example. Mm -hmm. How does this sit with the secular nature that you're talking about and the democracy to which you aspire? This is incorrect. Women represent 10% of the party's founding members. Such a huge percentage, if you consider the conservative nature of Egyptian society, is not at all there in any other party in Egypt. We are living in a conservative society, and a woman in such a society needs some time to be involved in political activity. We want more women participating, and we have women elected to the party's higher committee. We also have, unlike any other Egyptian party, two elected women on our executive board, our highest council. Also, we have about 100 Christian Copts amongst those who established the party. And you can imagine 100 Christian Copts in a party with an Islamic reference. It is a very positive sign. Then after the establishment of our party, dozens of Coptic brothers joined our party because we believe in a moderate Islam and we believe and the rights of women and rights of Copts. During the era of the former regime, the Copts were only selected and appointed by that regime because they did not have any real chances to run in elections and win seats. But now, there are Copts on our lists for the coming parliamentary elections and they are expected to win in certain constituencies. We do have our own different thoughts and ways. We do believe that Copts, exactly like Muslims, are first-class citizens. And we want to support a number of Copts in their campaign to enter the parliament through elections and voting. We, Muslims and Copts, will walk hand in hand in order to eliminate any artificial confusion, misunderstandings or suspicions. Muslims and Copts in Egypt are one. We stress this fact and we reject all sorts of discrimination and fabricated crises committed and created by the former regime against the Copts. We have no problems whatsoever with the Copts as long as there is a freedom of faith and that requires freedom of worship and that requires building places of worship.
So, why do we have the current crisis? The answer is the former regime. The former regime that has created a state of tension in the society. That's why we say our brothers the Copts have the right to build their own places of worship without any administrative complications. We cannot afford to politically gamble with this issue. The Muslims enjoy their rights of faith and worship and the Copts must have the same rights and we need to achieve this. In, in order to clarify, perhaps, um, Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey made the statement, for example, that people have the right to their religion. Mm -hmm. Parties do not necessarily s do. Do you agree with, with that particular outlook? Well, yes, to some extent. I don't agree 100% because the Turkish ruling party to which Erdogan belongs works within the limits of the Turkish constitution, which stresses the secularity of the country. The Turkish government would fall if Erdogan has said anything against the constitution. The situation in Egypt is different because our constitution says Islam is the religion of the country and the principles of Islamic Sharia are the reference when it comes to laws. In addition to that, all parties established under the umbrella of our constitution include both Muslims and Copts, because there is not in our country any faith-based discrimination, and all citizens are equal in rights and duties. At the same time, we appreciate the political statements mentioned by Erdogan during his visit to Egypt when he said that he is a Muslim and his party has nothing to do with religion. We cannot be described as a religious party. We are a civil party with an intellectual reference derived from the constitution that states principles of Islamic Sharia are the source of legislation. We are not against any different principles as long as they don't conflict with our constitution. The important point is not to have parties based on religion and not to have parties with military wings to achieve any goals. There has been some suspicion about statements made by the party. In the wake of the revolution, the party was saying it would not seek to gain a majority in the lower house that it would go for a maximum of 25% of the seats. Now you are saying that, no, we will go for perhaps 50% of the seats. Why the sudden change? Why this apparent um, position that you've now shifted your stance on whether or not you are going to go for a majority? Uh, well, listen, there's no change. The difference lies in words or expressions said by someone or another. At the beginning and after the revolution, the Muslim Brotherhood had the vision of not seeking a majority in the parliament and not nominating a candidate for the presidential elections. That was before the establishment of the party. But after the establishment of the party, we still have the same vision of not seeking a majority because our aim is to have around 30 to 35 percent of the seats but now, in order to reach that percentage, we need to nominate at least half of our qualified candidates so they can run. That's about 50% of all our available candidates. So we nominate half in order to gain 30 or 35% of the seats. That's what we mean. So there is no contradiction. Once again, your critics have contended that there's been a close relationship at times between the Muslim Brotherhood and the army, saying that at times it appears that the Brotherhood is almost taking direction from those that are running the country at present. Is there any agreement, some secret agreement between the Muslim Brotherhood mm -hmm. and the army of any form? No. no, no. There is no specific relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood or the Freedom and Justice Party on one side and the Supreme Military Council on the other side. The relationship is the same as the relationship between the army and any other party or political group in Egypt. 
The Supreme Military Council, after the revolution, listens to everyone and to different parties, activists, use of the revolution, writers, intellectuals and artists. The Military Council also listens to us, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Freedom and Justice Party, because we have a role and we enjoy a great popularity. We never had private meetings with the Military Council because our representatives are already included in whatever meetings the army has with all parties or groups. There's no need to accuse us of being in agreement with the military if we don't demonstrate every week back to back together with those willing to take to the street. Both the Muslim Brotherhood and the Freedom and Justice Party are big entities and have their leaders, and we do what is best for the country. We do nothing else whatever those accusations are. We've been severely accused in the past, but we've proved our critics wrong, because facts on the ground proved how right and correct our vision was. It happened that we said in the past there was no need now for these big demonstrations, and we warned of bad consequences because of some infiltrators, and we were right. They went for sit-ins, they went to the Israeli embassy, they went to the Saudi embassy. We reject and condemn any aggression on foreign embassies in Egypt. They also attacked the Home Ministry, and again, we reject that. We support the right to demonstrate and the right to express yourself and your anger, but we are definitely against destruction and sabotage. We are against storming embassies, regardless of our opinion towards Israel. This is a different story. We used to ask our regime to expel the Israeli ambassador from Egypt, to withdraw our ambassador from Israel, and to freeze relations between the two countries. But we cannot tolerate any assault on lives and properties of foreigners in our country because Egypt has signed international agreements and diplomatic protocols, and we respect these agreements and protocols. It's the role of the People's Assembly, the Parliament, and not us to approve the agreements and discuss the relations with foreign countries. I take all those points, but to be very specific, September the 9th, now that was a protest that was specifically against the use of military tribunals for the trial of civilians. And yet, both party and the Muslim Brotherhood itself stayed away from that, giving rise to the criticism that you did not want to go against the military on the basis of military trials for civilians. What is your response to that specific point? Uh, oh, sorry, can you repeat that? That the one specific occasion, September the 9th, was a protest specifically against the military tribunal. Yeah the army using military tribunals to try civilians. And yet both the party and the Muslim Brotherhood stayed away from that particular demonstration, giving rise to criticism mm -hmm. that there was an agreement with the army. What was your, your specific response to that? Mm -hmm. No, listen, listen. The citizens have the right to demonstrate and fully express themselves. The military has no right to disperse these demonstrations by force. We condemn using force against the demonstrators. But at the same time, we are against sabotage and destruction during these demonstrations. And we are against allowing both infiltrators with private agendas and thugs to be part of these demonstrations to hit at the stability and the security of this country. Stability and security are two massive challenges facing all of us during this interim period. The country is now facing a problem due to the collapse of a huge part of the police and due to the different mission of the armed forces personnel who are very well qualified to maintain the safety of the land, borders and airspace and not to deal with the unrest in the streets. The problem is the weakness of the interior front because the police cannot do their job properly and the armed forces personnel are not doing this job properly either because they are not qualified to deal with civilians. Also, there is a third party or group that does not want a stable and secure Egypt. This group makes matters more sensitive and critical. We need to move quickly into a democratic state. 
to establish stable institutions and authorities and to put an end to this interim era in which the military is protecting or guarding the revolution because we all know that the country should be governed by an elected civil body and the army should go back to their barracks. This will ensure a balance of power between various authorities. Are you losing patience with the speed at which this is happening? Are you losing patience with the Supreme Council of the Army, some argue, hanging on to power for too long? Uh, for sure, the army is facing some difficulties and problems because it wants to satisfy all conflicting parties. That's why I recommend a road map on an accurate timetable to be drawn by the military regardless of all objections. The military has also to meet the aims and targets of the majority of the Egyptians because it's impossible to satisfy every single one. The military has to keep and maintain the higher interests of the nation. We think it's enough time until June for the parliamentary elections, for a new constitution and for electing the new president. Any extension after next June would be an improper decision that might lead to more unrest and some of us might lose their patience. Is there an ultimatum here to the army that there must be presidential elections by next June because it is given no timetable whatsoever? Is this an ultimatum or is it a suggestion? The presidential elections must be held after the new constitution. This is our point of view. But I need to stress the country's need for a constitution that represents all Egyptians, regardless of age, sex or sect. It's not necessary to select only members of parliament for the constitutional committee. The committee to draft the constitution must include academics, trade unionists, parliamentarians, farmers, laborers, judges, and imams from Al-Azhar University and clergy from the church, so as for the constitution to represent everyone. The constitution should be independent of the parliamentary majority because such a majority is always subject to change. But the constitution is stable and must not be monopolized by anyone. We also reject any limitations to the will of the people. We don't need any principles above the constitution because nothing is above the constitution except the will of the people. Freedom will be there, but it will take some time before it's there for everyone. There's no need to treat each other as traitors because we are all Egyptians keen on Egypt and we all need to get to democracy and to overcome all difficulties. This is our point of view, and it's well known to the army. It's mentioned in our statements and declared in all our conferences and seminars. A final question, and are you confident that that can happen? Are you confident that all the people can come together regardless of religion, regardless of party, and actually form this democracy that everybody seems to want? Yes, I am positive. I am sure. I trust the Egyptian people. And relating the latest incidents to religion is fake, fabricated, and is serving private agendas to stop the process of democracy. The Egyptians, Muslims and Copts are mixed. Even with the latest incidents, and despite the sorrow and pain we all feel due to what happened and the lives we lost, in front of the radio and TV building, I can safely say these incidents are not sectarian because they turned from a demonstration into something else due to infiltrators who tried to shake the security and stability of the country. This is my reading of these incidents and it's now the time to put an end to these sectarian issues and to go to democracy. 
our party is keen to go with our brothers, the Copts, towards democracy through free and fair elections that take us, Muslims and Copts, to the parliament, where we have to express ourselves independently of ideology and religion. The Copts have the right to take their religion and their religious instructions as a guide and arbiter whenever they have any problems within their community. At the same time, we all, Muslims and Copts alike, will be governed by several laws applicable to all of us in our country. Mohammed Saad al Qatani, thank you so much for talking to Al Jazeera. Shukran. Shukran. Thank you very much.